hello everybody. This is a new edition of the previously released second Newton video. That is the Newton sequel, which goes absolutely in depth, exposing the depth of what was known in the 20th century about Newton's work on the Great Pyramid. Now, some of you didn't like the loud music, obviously, so it's been toned down. In many parts, it's been removed. I do hope you enjoy this new iteration of that. Now, Newton was just incredible, but bear in mind, this is all based on secondary sources. There is so much Newton material we just do not possess. I would love to have a copy of Newton's Pyramidographia. He wrote in the margins. That would be the best primary source in history, and you know primary sources are like gold to us historians. Now, we don't have that, but we work with what we can get. I will do further research into this and try and investigate deeper, try and find out exactly what Newton knew from Newton's own mouth. We're going to get into that, but firstly, the reiteration. I do hope you enjoy this, and I'll catch you after the video. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. A while back, I made a video about Isaac Newton's suspicion regarding the Great Pyramid. That video has clocked over 1 million views. I'm sure people want a lot more information on this, so I've done some digging, and here it is. To make this video, which is a bit challenging, I've gone into my library, and I'm relying on some really cool texts, such as Geezer the Truth, Peter Tompkins' Secrets of the Great Pyramid, Thoth, Architect of the Universe, and of course Sphinx Mystery, an old favourite of mine. For centuries, pyramid writers have been mentioning Newton's interest in the Great Pyramid and ancient measures. Some of it's in French. I don't need to mention all of them. We are going to get down to the bare bones of what we need to know. Why did Newton pursue an interest in the Great Pyramid? So mainly it's this. Newton was also working on gravitation throughout his life as a side project. He wanted the mass of the Earth, so he needed the circumference of the Earth to plug it into this equation. Newton was obviously obsessed with gravity and was toying with his as yet unpublished gravitational constant, F, the force between two objects. This equals some unknown gravitational constant, G, which he was trying to calculate by rearranging this formula. Now you can see what's missing from this formula. In order to test gravity's force, or rearrange this to find g, a fixed number, which Newton didn't know, but he was keen to find out, you would use one object, m1, of known mass, and another, m2, the Earth. You may as well use the Earth, as it's the one thing which we have access to, which is measurably pulling on everything. Yes, some experiments were done later with metal balls taking objects up mountains to measure G, where gravity is a little different, but that's a bit later on, more towards the 19th century. Newton wanted the weight of the Earth, its mass, and also the distance to its center of mass, as this is an inverse square law, which means he 
acknowledged gravity rapidly diminishing with distance, then you could simply plug in, say, a person's mass into the equation and work out the forces. From there, you can do anything. The acceleration of objects using Newton's other invention of calculus. It would open up everything, so you could see why Newton was obsessed with this. He had to get his hands on G. He needed the Earth to measure gravity. And voila, knowing this would give you the gravitational constant. Easy. So, that's the maths out of the way. Now, if you think Newton's some kind of genius, yes, he was, but no one does everything themselves. Newton was also standing on the shoulders of giants, as he claimed, because he was actually appropriating Robert Hooke's own gravitational law, which is what this is, but he claimed he was using it differently, and he sort of later said, yes, this is mine. Now, Hooke is famous because he saw the action of an elastic spring in everything and was trying to apply this law to the motion of the planets around the sun. Now, Newton was interested in everything, but not really that interested in Egyptian architecture for its own sake, or even Greek or Roman architecture. And no, he wasn't an archaeologist or much of an ancient historian for the sake of human interest stories. No, his mind was like a clock. You quickly see, reading his works, that he was interested in history, mainly because he was hugely interested in just two things, measure and time. He wanted to see how the ancients measured the world, and he wanted to see which events happened, in order to pinpoint every event from the creation of the world in about 4000 BC, to about 2160 AD, which is when he thought it would all grind to a halt. Newton was obsessed with Jewish architecture, not so much because it was pretty, but mainly because of the measure found within. The reason he preferred analysing Jewish architecture was that he thought the Egyptians, Greeks and Romans had fallen into polytheistic error. To study their architecture based around a polytheistic multi-god system would be to fall into the same corrupt errors of these ancient peoples. Newton, however, was an ancient historian his whole life, reading everything he could get his hands on about ancient kingdoms and empires, which in his day was probably less than the ancient Romans knew. So, what's this got to do with the Great Pyramid? Well, Newton may have noticed that Herodotus said that Cheops, who, according to Herodotus, had built the Great Pyramid, banned polytheism, closed the temples. I personally suspect this might have aroused Newton's interest in the Great Pyramid, not to mention its colossal dimensions and apparent perfection. So, despite the fact it was located among polytheists, the Egyptians, Newton was highly interested in the Great Pyramid and in its inner chambers. You might call him something of a pyramidologist, as he searched for the secrets of space and time in the dimensions of the pyramid. Now, why would he do this? In my most popular video, Newton's suspicion of the Great Pyramid may shock you. I stated that Newton may have suspected that the pyramid was built by a technological civilization of giants before the deluge. I said this because he would have noted the Bible says the world was one language, presumably when the pyramid was built. However, that is just a secular way of looking at it, because Newton also believed in God, so he may have thought the measurements contained in the pyramid or Temple of Solomon were given to monotheists as a divine revelation. Newton was very, very well read, and he would have noticed that classical writers all seem to agree that 1 on 600 of a geographical degree equals 1 stadia, whatever that means. That would have amazed him. Firstly, it implies knowledge of a round Earth, and also the size of the Earth. There were many different stadia, each city had their own. So which stadia are you talking about? Stadia were defined in yards or cubit, and everyone had a different measure. If you were Athenian, a cubit was 18 inches. But if you were Roman, it was 17.5 inches. A cubit is your arm length, to the finger. We don't use it anymore, but we still use feet. But strangely, our feet are 12 inches, possibly because humans were once a lot bigger. Newton also read possibly that the Greek Eratosthenes said the circumference of the Earth is 250,000 stadia. This must have made Newton very happy, but he needed to know what a stadia actually was. It varies from about 172 yards if you're a Greek traveller, to about 230 yards if you're a Phoenician. So, the problem is, as you can see, whose stadia are you talking about? There are hundreds to choose from. Every city in Greece had their own version, and surrounding countries had similar, though different units. How was Newton supposed to get the size of the Earth? 
Newton knew that a minute error would compound over the size of the Earth and destroy the calculation, so he needed an exact stadia and an exact cubit and an exact inch where to get it. So Newton thought, aha, uh -huh, just what I need, and, and he started investigating all these different ancient measures and, and started really getting into this, and I, I honestly think he gave himself a splitting headache as his book on this is enormous and very boring. Now, Newton also wrote the book A Dissertation Upon the Sacred Cubit of the Jews. He noted striking similarities between the British imperial system, the Roman system, and measurement systems going back to ancient Jews and Egyptians, perhaps a, a legacy of when the world was one language. Now, Newton was a rena Renaissance man. He believed in their maxim, as above, so below. The man as a microcosm of the universe, like Vitruvian man. He believed the temple also was a microcosm. So he went about studying the dimensions of the Temple of Solomon, like a fanatic, to get, to get these units, these original units. Now, it is long suspected in hunting, say, Solomon's Temple or the Great Pyramid, that Newton was hunting down a ratio, a unit or a ratio, which would give him the geomantic Earth measure that he needed to proceed in his gravitation calculation. The point I was making in my 1 million views plus video on this is that it follows that Newton thought the ancient civilization was actually more advanced than his own. Newton was busy studying Jewish monuments, but then he read that Diodorus Siculus, in my mind a far greater historian than Herodotus, wrote the pyramid is a stadium in length. That would be a perfect whole number, leaving little doubt whose stadia you should be working with. So, did Newton start to see the Great Pyramid as the original architect of mankind, the original unit of measure? Now, let's backtrack, because this is amazing. Not only did the pyramid represent and contain measures of the Earth, but it itself claimed to represent the Earth. What am I talking about? This is unbelievable, but we need to cover it, because Newton may have been aware of this. We why should the pyramid represent the Earth in the first place? Well, I think the following is the reason. Are you ready? The pyramid is literally screaming out, I am a circle. By making its ascending angle 51 degrees, 51 minutes up, the pyramids, the, the Egyptians made it trigonometric, which means circle measure, so that it describes the circular formula, pi equals two times the base over the height, and this is seen in all three Giza pyramids, but lesser so, or not really at all in any of the other pyramids. Which means these pyramids are really special. This means that phi, the golden number, is also incorporated where phi equals two times the apothem over the base. The apothem is the radius of a polygon to its nearest perpendicular edge. Now, phi isn't just used in art by people like Leonardo to make a painting look beautiful. Check out Wikipedia. It's used in probability theory, theory, thermodynamics, everything, even plasma cosmology. We are literally made of phi. The results of applying these formula are spectacular, with the, the Great Pyramid clocking in at 0.01% accuracy, or possibly even more. Or less accurate, as there are different way, uh, more or less accurate, as there are different ways to measure the base. Lawton and Ogilvy Herald in their book study this in depth, and there is no doubt about any of this. They emphasize that the angle of the pyramid, 51 degrees, 51 minutes, is the only angle that works for both formulas. So the Egyptians had to make it like this, simply for the pyramid to scream at us, hey, I'm a circle, look at me, I contain the secrets of the universe. So possibly to the initiator, the pyramid is saying, hey, I describe a circle, and is this not also the shape of the world? Now. Imagine building that thing on that angle just to say that. It's waving a huge red flag at us. So in other words, pyramidology, which is what this is, is a kind of, it's kind of already built into the pyramid. So you cannot accuse people of inventing pyramidology out of ignorance, although in the 19th century they probably went overboard by relating it to events in the Bible and prophecy. I think Newton would have come up with this on the spot, or at least his subconscious let him know that something wasn't quite right, and so he realized, hey, this pyramid represents the Earth, though this is not found in his writings. Then again, his lab burned down, destroying all his books. Now, he also knew that Herodotus said that the pyramid was built so the area of each face would equal the area of a square whose side is equal to the pyramid's height. Again, this would have aroused Newton's interest, a perfect geometrical object. Perhaps here, 
he could finally find the true length of the cubit and the stadia that he had been seeking. As fast as he could, Newton grabbed the work of Greaves, a travelling Englishman decades earlier who measured what he could of the partially submerged sides of the Great Pyramid, writing a book about it, as well as dimensions of the interior. Newton's eyeballs would have popped out of his head as, bizarrely, Greaves described the pyramid in his own time of the late 1500s as the sides, smooth and equal, the whole fabric, free of ruptures and breaches. God knows what he saw, possibly a smooth-sided pyramid with casing stones intact. It is said that Greaves got the measure of the outer sides wrong, but it's hard to muck up the measurements of the king's chamber, which is also the heart and most ornate part of the Great Pyramid, with its walls covered in pink granite. Newton would have appreciated this. So, not only is the Great Pyramid waving its hands in the air, screaming, I'm a trigonometric object, based on the circle, and that circle could possibly be the Earth, but I think it's obvious that the king's chamber is saying the same thing, as it contains the length and width of 20 times 10 cubits, which could be applied to a circle instead of a rectangle as a code. For example, 20 diameter, radius 10. In other words, the king's chamber is also saying, I'm a circle, look at me, look at my secrets. Newton was thinking, hmm, very interesting, but we do not actually know what he was thinking. These are assumptions made by later authors. He read this description of Greaves, and he must have thought, hmm, this pyramid is a mo is a most perfect ancient is the most perfect ancient building there is, and possibly the most advanced ancient society. So therefore, I had better use the Great Pyramid to tell me exactly how much the cubit is, so I can get the Egyptian stadia, so I can see their conception of the size of the planet. Newton also thought the Jewish God was real, and the Jews coming out of Egypt uh, must uh, have at the earliest time used these same Egyptian cubits. So why not? Now, Newton did investigate the pyramid uh, based on the work of Greaves, and he came up with two cubits, the short and the long. The theory goes that the polar axis end-to-end -end was found to be about 500 million inches, which is therefore 20 million Egyptian cubits pole to pole, with a ratio of 10 million cubits, uh, a radius of 10 million cubits. It, it, it kind of fits the 10 and 20 of the king's chamber. Newton could turn this into British inches with a simple multiplier. The Egyptian and British inch were strangely almost identical. It is said that Newton might have been playing with these measures, but unfortunately G was not accurately calculated until well after his death. So whether Newton had any success is where it all starts to get rather unclear. People have written for centuries that Newton used this in his theory of gravitation, but I don't know the original source. Possibly there are some unpublished works uh, which really describe what he was up to. I'm keeping an eye out for some original document, hopefully written by Newton, but I suspect a lot of what Newton appreciated has been interpolated by authors in subsequent centuries, and I'm hoping some secret document turns up, which... Uh, does actually happen more than you would think. I think that was some of Newton's thought process. It would partly explain his obsessive, ridiculous, insane, spectrumy interest in ancient measures. 
I've surely left out a whole heap of information, but there is only so much you can do. This is an enormous topic. It needs way more research. The best compilation I've read personally on pyramid ratios, and the people who looked into this is Dr. Robert Schock's Pyramid Quest, uh, which I'm proud to say I've actually finished reading as it contains a mind-boggling, headache-inducing amount of information on pyramidologists and ratios. Peter Tompkins is also an amazing, uh, deceptively coffee-table-sized source, but it's, it's, it's really deceptive because his books are really long and in-depth. So this is a real topic, a credible topic, which archaeologists don't have the interest to touch, let alone the guts. So it's up to us in the ancient mysteries community to find the truth. Well, Newton was quite a character, wasn't he? One of the things I like about him is he was just so unbelievably open-minded, just incredibly open-minded. And that is actually rare among academics. The most open-minded academics are the best academics. Newton investigated the pyramids. He did alchemy. He did so for his own reasons. If only he had weighed the products and the reactants and kept them all in a sealed vessel, he would see that the products and the reactants are the same weight. That would allow him to discover, it would have allowed him to discover modern chemistry, which is all based on weights, how much different atoms weigh. He didn't do that. He was going in another direction, something else that he was working on. Newton is amazing. Just a brilliant mind. I wish I knew more. That's all I know about Newton and the pyramids. I wish I knew more to tell you guys, but we are going to look deeper in future. I'm going to try and get my hands on some of those primary, primary, primary sources. I'm going to read older pyramid books. My oldest pyramid books are, I think, from the 1930s, written by pyramidologists, but they're actually not old enough. Anyway, guys, catch you soon in the next video. And by the way, it's going to be a real good one. A Dr. Charles special presentation, a new discovery based on the Giza layout. Oh boy, that Giza layout is really something, isn't it? Cheers.